My parents were both elementary music teachers. They were together as a couple until my dad passed recently, in, uh, about uh, four years ago. My dad and I were incredibly close. He was unconditionally loving and supportive, and I always strive to make him proud. Education was always a priority uh, from my parents and from uh, both sides. I believe I might have been the first child who was black to go from the first to the 12th grade in the Chappaqua school system. Being the only black kid in the class, that's something that I knew very well because that's that was kind of my my path from that early age on I knew that I was different and my parents said just because you're different you're gonna have to do better than everyone else to be considered equal I had no idea that winning a Miss America title in 1983 would actually be so significant to people that had lived through the civil rights movement and that to me was such an honor, but also something that I had no idea the, the weight and that there might be some bad consequences uh, to have white people who wanted to kill me because I was black and, and to have death threats against my family because uh, they, they felt that I was tarnishing the Miss America crown because I was a black person. So it was, it was an incredible time. I would love to find out whether someone else within my ancestral past did the same thing and made a change or was noticed or did something that changed other people's lives. I'm heading out to our family plot at Pine Hollow Cemetery out in Long Island to pay a visit to my dad. It feels like a good place to try and find some information on my dad's side of the family and to begin my journey. My dad would tell stories about uh, growing up in Oyster Bay. They didn't have much, pretty rural upbringing, but always full of love and joy. Um, and he always kind of reminisced with a smile. The cemetery is right back here. This is the family hill. It's wonderful to have a place to go and to connect with my dad. And when I call upon him, I can feel his presence. It's nice to start the journey here with my dad, searching for his roots on his behalf. He would be so happy to be on this journey with me, and I know he is. I'm coming out here to visit, but this time I'm looking for clues. I'm hoping to find some information on my ancestors' headstones that I might not have noticed before. I know almost nothing about my dad's father's side of the family, the Williams side, but I do know that my dad's mother's name was Iris Carl. Her father was Frank Carl, and his father was my great-great-grandfather, David Carl. But um, David Carl, it looks like company one, 26 US, I would assume this is colored, and that would mean infantry, I think. 1861 to 1865, I guess that would be the Civil War which would be amazing. So that's a pretty big clue. My question would be, what happened to him? Did he make it, if he was a veteran in the Civil War, did he make it back alive? And what was the catalyst to make him want to serve? Since my family has lived in this area for more than 100 years, I'm gonna meet with the town historian here in Oyster Bay to find out if there are any records that address David Carl's enlistment in the Civil War. Mm. John, my heart is racing right now. But the record you're most interested in mm -hmm. will be this record of uh -huh. soldiers from 1861 to 1865. 
we go to page 33, Thirty-three. At the very top, mm -hmm. you'll see a name that you're familiar with. David Carl. Enlisted January 2nd, 1864. In New York, blacks were first allowed to enlist December 23rd, 1863. Within the first week of, of their eligibility, he enlisted. Wow. He was a brave man to sign up, especially in a time where there was a lot of uncertainty. There was quite a risk. There was quite an opposition and a big question as to would the black soldiers be accepted with the white soldiers? Mm -hmm. So he was married, bounty, $300. Yes, mm -hmm. early in the war, mm -hmm. they paid a bounty of $75 for enlisting. Really? Right? By the, this time, the bounty had risen to $300. That's a lot of money back in the day. Yeah, <laughs> so we have another record. This is a record of the purchase of land by David Carl on January 7th, 1864. So, five days later, after he enlisted, he purchased this land. The bounty was $300, and the land cost $200. $200. Yeah. So he bought it to secure property for his, his wife and his family. This is where it all started. Uh -huh. Discharged August 28th, 1865, P.O. Address, Oyster Bay, Queens County, New York. So he survived the he war. He survived, yes. The question is, when he did serve, where did it take him? There's no indication of what happened to him or where he went in the war. For that, you're going to have to go to the National Archives. National means Washington, D.C.? Yes, it looks like you're going to Washington. I'm going to Washington, D.C., okay. Yeah. I'm learning that my great-great-grandfather was an incredibly selfless man. He put his life at risk, enlisting in the Civil War in order to earn money and buy land for his family. I'm heading to Washington, D.C. to try to find out more about the risks he was taking. I want to take a look on Ancestry.com to see if there are any other records on David Carl. Let's uh, load it up. 1870 census. So David Carl, 27 male, mulatto. Okay, Louisa, 27, same age, his wife. W. She was white. Hmm. And then the kids were M.M., Mulatto, Mulatto. One of them, my great-granddad. But to, in 1870, to be an interracial couple. So he was married to Louisa when he went to war, being free in the United States meant something. He had the freedom, obviously, to marry who he wanted in a time where I can't imagine how difficult that would have been. It was difficult within my lifetime. And I'm four generations after him. I'm getting a clearer picture of who my great-great-grandfather was. He was breaking down barriers, taking risks on both the home front and by going to war. But what I really want to know is what happened to him after he left his family and joined the service.
think we're going to start with the pension file first. This entire file is on your soldier, is on David Carl. Really? These are the original documents. This is a good one to start with. Mm -hmm. Why don't you, you can touch it. Oh, can I? Okay. Yeah, you can. Department of Interior, David Carl, Oyster Bay. When were you born? At Oyster Bay, 1845. What was your occupation? And engaged with Boatwise Steamer. He worked on steamers. Oh, okay. He was a, a crew. Okay. On steamers. With the oyster industry in, in Oyster Bay. The color of your skin. Colored. Okay. Mm -hmm. Were you a slave? And he wrote never. He was never. He was born a free man. Wow. Never. Period. That's awesome. It is. Ah. Enlisted in the Union Army to go to war to save men who were not free. Absolutely. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. Wow. And when I was going through this, I um, came across something that was really pretty special. Actually, we might need to uh -oh. put on gloves for a minute. Gloves. Okay. okay. Wow. Is this a picture? Oh my gosh. Wow. Can you see it? It's called a tintype. That's an image. That's him. He sent it in to say, I'm David Carl. He's in his union uniform. I thought he looked like my brother immediately. When I saw this, I thought, oh my gosh, we have to bring this to light. Go ahead. Oh my goodness. My heart is about to jump. Look at that. You can pick David it up. David Carl. Look at that. And there's the flag. The handsome guy. So is this unusual to find an actual tin type in a file? In the 20 some years I've been doing this yeah. research here at the National Archives, it's the first time <gasps> really? that I have found a tin type in a pension file. He was just waiting. And he looks like a proud man. Mm-hmm. He was risking a lot. The Confederate Congress said, if we capture a black Union soldier, we will not put him in a POW camp. They'll kill him? Or they'll put him in slavery. <sighs> wow. Yeah. What a risk. It was quite a risk. Do the records show where he served? This is it. This is called the Record of Events, Company I. Company I, 26. 26. U.S. Yes. Colored Infantry. Mm -hmm. And this will tell us May and June of Buford, South Carolina. Carolina. That's where they were headed. Okay. Do we know what happens in Buford, South Carolina? What you're going to have to do is meet up with maybe a historian whose specialty is the campaigns that occur down in South Carolina. Uh, I feel another trip coming up. I think so. <laughs> You've not been to Buford? I've never think, been to Buford. Well, I think you're going to have to go there to find out. I think there's much more to the story. That's still incredible. I knew David Carl risked his life as a soldier in the Civil War, but it's even more frightening to think that as a black Union soldier fighting in the South, he could have been enslaved. I just want to get down to South Carolina and find out what happened to him. Look at these trees. It looks like the deep south. Imagine this road a little bit more narrow than it is now. OK. But uh, the loose sand and uh, literally hundreds of soldiers marching. And how many would be marching at a time? The 26th would have about a 1,000 men in it, fully, fully manned. OK, 
Perry explained that David Carl and the 26th Colored Regiment engaged in at least two different battles while they were stationed in South Carolina. But he took me to the field where the fighting was intense, the location of the Battle of Bloody Bridge. 4 p.m. on the afternoon of July 7th, they come up this, into this open field, yeah. raining down on them from the artillery shrapnel found on this battlefield. Oh, my god. So David Carl dodged one of those pieces of shrapnel. Whoa. Some folklore from the area say that the creek ran red with blood mm -hmm. after this battle of Bloody Bridge. work wasn't done. Really? After the surrender of Lee's army to Grant, right. his army still doesn't go home. Really? In fact, they may be performing the most gratifying duty that the soldiers who serve in the United States Colored Troops actually performed. This is a letter from one of the soldiers in the regiment. Our duty is to let the colored people know that they are free citizens of the United States and to protect them as such their duty was to ensure that the Emancipation Proclamation was enforced. So they are a liberating army, and wow. they do the job of liberation duty. That's fantastic. Soldiers like David Carl, they, they do the sure work. Ah, oh, amen. That's amazing. He was a freedom fighter, enlisted by his own free will, left his home and his family, and came down here to a place where he ensured other men of color could live like he did, which was free. And after all of this, after all the hardships, he returned home to have kids, which had kids, which had my dad, which had me. It's, it's wonderful. It opens up more questions for me because if I had Southern roots, what were those stories like? They might not have had the opportunity to be born free. What were their stories? And what was their life? I'm sure it was markedly different. I would love to explore that. Because my dad's not here to answer questions, I'm heading to Baltimore to visit his older brother, my Uncle Earl. I'm hoping that Uncle Earl has some clues for me about the lineage on my dad's father's side of the family. I got a great picture of the Carl family, but I know virtually nothing about the Williams side of my ancestry. Hello. Hi, Nessa. <laughs> How, How are you? Are you? Mm -hmm. Good to see you. Yeah, same here. How's it going? <laughs> Good. Good. <laughs> wow, I've been on such a journey. Yeah. And I've got lots of questions for you. Uh -huh. Look at these family photos. Okay. Now, um, where's this is your dad when he graduated from high school. Uh, and your grandfather, Milton. Milton Sr. Yeah. Matter of fact, uh, here's his picture. He was 19 at that time. 1930. So he was born around 1911 or so? Yeah. He was born in Memphis. Ah, uh, OK. His, his dad was a barber, and his name was John Hill Williams. That's his father's name? Yeah. Yeah. So his father was a, a barber, you said? And, a barber. And he was John Hill yes. Williams. OK. And do you, know, do you know what his wife's name was? No, that's, you don't know that's the mystery, too. That's the mystery. Dad's mom died when he was so young mm -hmm. that uh, right. he didn't know. He wasn't one year old yet when she died. Right. Then John Hill Williams died. OK. Uh, dad was 11. So Milton Sr., your, your father and my dad's father, since he lost his mom at a young age and then lost his father, John Hill Williams, at 11, at 11 yeah. we don't really know much about his side of the family at all. No, it, it grieved him to talk about those things, yeah. I think. That's painful. Yeah. Oh, my Uncle Earl. He's the closest thing I have to my dad. And I'm so grateful that he could fill in some of the gaps. Love you. Yeah, oh. I love you too. OK. OK. Off to my journey. My next mission, to find out more about John Hill Williams, 
who was a barber in Memphis, Tennessee, and who was his wife? It's like reading the story of my father's life. I know that Milton Sr., my grandfather, was born around 1912. Okay. So I'm looking for um, more information on his dad and his mother. His mother died uh, very early in his life, so we have nothing. Okay, so here's the 1910 census. This is a little hard to read. And actually, the, the family's right at the right very top, top there. John Williams. And, and look over here. You knew he was a barber, right? So right. we'll go way Memphis. over here. Okay, barber. Yeah. And own shop. Ran his own barber shop. Fantastic. Isn't that great? And Mary, wife, Mary Williams. Mary. Mary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah, Does it say female? white? Well, it's, it's in you. Oh, mulatto. mulatto. Okay. Mm -hmm. In the 1910 census in particular, the definition for that was anybody with uh, some noticeable African-American blood. Right. So, so that's, that's Milton's mom. Wow, Mary Williams. I, I went further and I searched for her obituary record. And this is, this is amazing. This is the obituary? This, th yeah, this is her obituary. Oh my okay, gosh. so this, this tells you a whole lot about the family. This is kind of eerie. Uh -huh. Friday evening, February 20th, 1914. So my grandfather was two. Okay. At 725, Mary Williams, age 38 years, mother of Clarence, Arthur, and Milton, and daughter of Elizabeth and the late William Fields. So her name is Mary Fields. Yeah. So Mary Fields. And her father is William Fields. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, that's a great clue. So now I know that my great-grandfather's wife was Mary Fields and that her father, my great-great-grandfather, was William Fields. And here is the 1880 census. All right, so they're still in the same area. Okay. That's William, W-M. W-M. There's, so if we look right across here. School teacher. Ah. So he was a teacher. Interesting. So huh. you have school teachers in your family? My, both my parents are school teachers. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So if he was a school teacher and he was mulatto. Right. So he's a man of color. In as Tennessee. A school teacher, in Tennessee, he must have been an educated man to teach school. And so soon after the Civil War. Yeah. That's also fascinating. And they're all born in Tennessee, OK? Tennessee. So they got some Tennessee roots. Serious roots. Every clue I get is just another piece of the puzzle to my life and who I am. Education was in our blood, and the importance of education is here in black and white, right in front of us. Today, I'm flying south from Baltimore to Nashville to meet Kathy Lauder from the Tennessee State Library and Archives. She's asked me to meet her at the state capitol. This is a bust that we just installed in the statue of Samson Keeble, mm -hmm. who was the first African-American legislator in Tennessee. Ah. And I thought you might like to see this first. We're very proud of this. Samson Keeble, first African-American representative to the Tennessee state legislator. 19th century. <gasps> Look at the W. William A. Fields? Yes. Whoa. That would be someone you know. <laughs> you can so he was? He was a legislator from Shelby County, and he served in the Tennessee House of Representatives. Fantastic. One of the first African Americans elected, so it was very impressive. Wow. And the, those were his dates from the, uh, 1885 to 86. He was in the 44th General Assembly. Phenomenal. Is this is the, this is where he actually would come to work? Yes. And wow. in this very building, and oh it was God. very much like this. It hasn't changed. Very impressive. Wow. If you'd like, we can go inside. Sure, I'd love to see where okay, he works. Go right around here. Okay. It's an extraordinary discovery to find out that my ancestor William A. Fields made history here in Tennessee. I made history in my own right, but this is where it all begins. 
This is the photograph of the 44th General Assembly. And your ancestor is number 33 closest <gasps> to the legend there. <gasps> and that's William A. Field. Look. <gasps> oh my gosh. Amazing that I can put a face to the name. And we've made you a copy of his, of his <gasps> picture to take with you. Oh my God. <laughs> this is amazing. Wow. We know roughly where the Shelby delegation sat. Would you like to go sit I would over there where he sat? I'd love to see Thank where he sat. Oh my God. says it was burned by the Ku Klux Klan. Oh. Wow. The first thing I'd like to show you is the certificate of election that he brought in when he was elected and came in. And how did that happen, uh, a colored man in Tennessee, to be well, elected? Well, at about the time of the Civil War, a fourth of the population of Tennessee were slaves. A fourth of the a population? A fourth. And so after the war ended, some of the counties had a higher percentage of black residents right. than white residents. And so once these people started to vote, right. then there showed up black people in a lot of the local positions, as well as here's someone coming to the house. Fantastic. And here they've come right out of slavery. Nobody even believes they're human yet. There are right. people who don't think that they're people. And it was a spectacular thing to have black people in the legislature. This one I thought you might be particularly interested in. It's a bill to be entitled an act to require parents and guardians to send their children to school. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it's education. an education. There we go. Oh, maybe this is an interest that you A common theme in my life. Yes. Wow. All parents and guardians having children in care between the ages of seven and 16 years and physically able shall have them regularly enrolled in a district, town, or city, public or private school. He was a school teacher and he wanted to make sure that everybody statewide had the same opportunity. Well, and it was so urgent at that point for the African Americans to be educated because they had been punished if they'd learned to read while they were slaves. And now suddenly, here they had the opportunity to get a real education for the first time. Right. Wow. And this was passed? To a committee. To a committee? Where it died. Oh. Drats! It was a very tough time for them, trying to pass these laws, trying to improve their lot. They had just a small window of opportunity to do that. So we're, we're watching this window, which starts in 1867, when the vote is available, getting narrower and narrower until finally, a couple of administrations after this one, it's gone. So he's toward the tail end. He's the next to the last group. From 1888 until 1965, there were no black faces in the House of Representatives. It was oh. 77 years. You gotta be kidding. This was the beginning of something that would go on for a very long time. So just when you think you've made progress, mm -hmm. I'm learning what a noble and pioneering man William A. Fields was, but it's left me with more questions than answers. What happened in Tennessee that prevented any more African-American men from holding office for almost 80 years? And what happened to William after he left office? I'm heading to Memphis, where William A. Fields was listed in the 1880 census with his family. I have an appointment with Dr. Beverly Bond of the Public Library. You must be Beverly. She's an expert on 19th century African-American history. There seemed to be a significant amount of time where there were no people of color, men of color, uh, that were serving as representative for years. Can you tell me why that is? Blacks had voted in Tennessee from the late 1860s. Right. But in the 1880s and into the 1890s, you begin to see that closing of opportunities. In the 1890s, states like Tennessee and Mississippi change their constitutions and make it more difficult for blacks to vote uh, with poll taxes, sometimes literacy tests, 
residency requirements. You have the violence that comes about in the 1880s lynching. and 1890s, the yeah. lynchings, the um, race riots. In Tennessee, you've got this racial violence that's, in a sense, being organized, um, to use the terms of today, into terroristic organizations like the Klan that were established primarily to maintain a sense of pre-Civil War order in the mm -hmm. South. systematically squeezed out. Yes, yes. That, that's one part of the story. The yeah. other part is within that place that they are being pushed into, they create these strong black communities mm -hmm. uh, with their own schools and their churches. Right. So it's, you know, it's a, a very prideful community that is struggling against segregation. As an example, um, Tyler Chapel, African Methodist Episcopal Church, is a, a clear reference that we can use. It's a church that was started by former slaves in the aftermath of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. It eventually, it, is, it says it was burned by the Ku Klux Klan. Oh. Wow. If you look a little further, you'll see some of the early ministers who are listed there, but mm -hmm. also the Sunday school superintendents. And if you just kind of look down to the list. Look at this. The Honorable W.A. Fields, resigned and deceased. Mm -hmm. And then we have a copy of his obituary. A small obituary from the, um, the local newspaper. William A. Fields, a justice of the peace, died yesterday morning at 5 o'clock at his home in his 52nd year. 52. He was a Negro member of the county court and had the respect of that entire court, having been a justice of the peace for 10 years. That's the first time I've heard about the county court being associated with his name. Yes. So his knowledge and his education served him well. It is so heartbreaking for me to know that my great-great-grandfather died before he was able to see any progress in the fight against segregation. But since I know that he was a member of the court, my next stop will be the Shelby County Archives. I'm hoping to find information on William A. Fields standing in the court. something for you in the quarterly court. Big red book. Mm -hmm. Minutes, July 1898 to July 1899. William A. Fields served on the quarterly court, and I did find something interesting here on page 250. Okay. There. W.A. Fields. The committee appointed at the present term of this court to draft resolutions touching the death of W.A. Fields, Esquire. William A. Fields was born near Fisherville in Shelby County about 52 years ago. Fisherville, near Fisherville, where, where, what was Fisherville like? Well, at that time when he was born, uh, that would have been a cotton plantation area. And mm. most likely he was born a slave on the plantation. Uh, he was faithful and true, discharging with fidelity every trust confided to his keeping. While he has not left large earthly riches to his afflicted family, he has bequeathed them a legacy more precious than gold, 
more imperishable than monumental brass, a spotless name. Sounds a lot like my dad. And this is, this is my dad's story of a man who taught and changed people's lives, was faithful and true to his family. And it's like reading the story of my father's life. But this is 100 years before he was ever alive. It's, it's extraordinary. It just makes me so proud of the men that I am descended from and the family that I come from. <sighs> wow. My journey has come to an end, so I'm heading home to Los Angeles to share all of these incredible discoveries with my mom, my brother Chris, and one of my daughters, Sasha. Glad you went. Oh, it was fantastic. I wish I could have taken you on every step. Wow. I never thought I'd find two pictures of right. ancestors that far back. Exactly. Amazing. Oh, Dad would be so. He would be so delirious excited. with excitement. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Isn't it extraordinary that here's a free man of color right. deployed down uh, to fight for emancipation and to end slavery? Yeah. But yet, and then this is an educated man who was born into slavery. Right. and picked up the ball after David Carl's troops freed the slaves and tried to make sure that uh, every freed child had the right to an education. Wow. You know, so it was a, it's an amazing through line. Mm -hmm. That's your great, great, great grandfather. Mm -hmm. The through line that I get from my two great, great grandfathers is that the men in my life have been heroes that have made a difference and been there for their families. What I loved about this journey was the amazing parallel with my dad's legacy. The fact that my dad served in the army, that he was a school teacher, uh, he, was, he was very heroic in, in his life. And it's my responsibility to teach my own children the value of their roles in history, just as my father taught me.